Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, drillers, billers, and serial killers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel, where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to Random Reviews, folks, where we take what usually amounts to a work of canonical literature, um, put it in the an anatomical position on the table, uh, slit open its stomach and see what's going on underneath the hood, as it were. Um, but just first of all, if you'll bear with me, uh, this is a final call uh, this, uh, at the 11th hour, my first uh, our, our, our Joe Spivey uh, YouTube channel's inaugural read-along will be commencing on maybe Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday or whatever, but it's it's starting now, um, and you need to be getting the reading done now. So this is this is the final call uh, for you guys to either get a copy or download something online or you know fish something out from the uh, your plethoric bookstores, which I'm sure you are in possession of. Um, you do go and find yourselves a copy of this is Byron, Life and Legend by Fiona McCarthy, a very serviceable biography indeed. Um, and we are going to be reading up to, I think it's about one page 130, um, which is entitled Childhood and the East, folks. Um, so get that done over the weekend, ready to discuss in uh, uh, outstanding and unbelievable detail on Monday and Tuesday. Um, so yes, please do grab yourselves a copy, get hold of it in any way possible. Um, I'll be selling copies with my DNA on it uh, in a week or so's time, so you may be able to get it uh, post-mortem after that. But um, yes, bar and life and legend, get it read, the first chapter, so that we can all have a very good chat on it. And if you attend the lecture and haven't done the reading, then I will know, folks, okay? I will pincer you, and I will root out your weaknesses like your worst pedagogical nightmare. Um, so that's bar and life and legend. Get yourselves a copy and read it for our first read-along. Um, but anyway, let us get back to the meat and gristle. Um, this is James O'Brien's How They Broke Britain, folks. This came out in December of 2023 uh, and has been on my TB, not TBR, but my, my want list for uh, uh, very, 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 very long. Uh, I was given it for my birthday, thankfully, in hardback. Um, and yes, this is a, this is a, um, yeah, another sort of bristling, uh, very sort of angry and yet really controlled and detailed and pugilistic and, um, yes, very, very driven book um, highlighting, you know, it's a charge sheet essentially of about seven or eight individuals um, that have, yeah, put Britain, you know, put Britain on the map as uh, a country of ridicule and have, yeah, put us to our very knees and readied us for national decapitation. Um, it might, I mean, as a, as a small caveat before this video, uh, James O'Brien runs a, uh, a radio show on LBC, Monday to Friday, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., um, where he discusses, you know, current affairs, the, 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 the state of the nation, and that which, you know, is going on right now. Um, and, of course, his detractors have mischaracterised him as a, the, the Ramona-in-chief, as the soppy, wet, namby-pamby liberal, um, with, you know, blue hair and seven, 740 uh, pronouns and somebody who thinks that you can identify as a postbox if you want. That, of course, is uh, objectively and um, observably incorrect. Um, but yes, this is, this is how they broke Britain. Uh, there's an enormous introduction in here, about 50 or 60 pages, which meanders and, you know, goes about the place. You, you sense this is one of my overall critics of the book, is that O'Brien has so much to write about in such a short period of time. He has so many malevolences and transgressions to document and to detail and to uh, obviously rightfully criticise. Um, that the, I mean, the style's not bad as, as regards, um, you know, angry political tomes go. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very readable, and you can tell he's done an awful lot of uh, reading of canonical literature like our darling cherubs on this channel have done. Um, you can tell the stuff there, but it does feel rushed. He's... he's he very often refers to events that take place in June and July of 2023, even when this book was uh, ready for publication uh, by December 2023. So it was, it was obviously, you know, rushed through the, 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 the printing houses. And um, yeah, time was very much not on his side, given that, um, you know, <laughs> additions to the book were just sort of sprouting out of nowhere in uh, August and September when it was due out in December. But anyway, yes, uh, he focuses on uh, a few individuals uh, that I want to just, just go into and then we'll read sections of the book. And there are, there are parts of the book that I want to critique, uh, even though overall I would be congratulatory and adulatory and altogether nodding in agreement. Um, first of all, I've shot through this, which shows how interested I am either in the topic or the author. Um, but yes, this is, first of all, he talks about the media mogul Rupert Murdoch, the Australian, um, who I think has just stepped down from you know, sort of operational significance in many of his enterprises, but you sense uh, all of his employees and the company in general are probably still very much under his thumb. Um, but yes, he, who has, um, for purely uh, commercial and, 
you know, monetizable reasons, James O'Brien states, has, um, yeah, created a media empire which is um, um, unswervingly sycophantic to the people that grab most uh, the most eyeballs and therefore the most attention, whether that's uh, the Trump Brigade and Steve Bannon um, across the pond in America, or the, whether it's Nigel Farage and, you know, David Icke and these, these um, mercurial, uh, enigmatic figures that don't seem to have an awful lot of uh, you know, history in any sort of academy or any, you know, any sort of life experience apart from their political significance. Um, yes, and, and O'Brien clearly shows how he went from being uh, quite a good journalist as a very young person or, or somebody who, yeah, was interested in journalistic integrity, as Joe Barton would have it, um, but somebody who, who soon fell for, um, you know, capital accruements, very, very uh, fickle um, aims. And then next up we have Paul Dacre, who was for very many years the editor of the Daily Mail, who um, incited probably the largest um, sort of jingoistic fervour that this country has ever seen. Um, it, you know, the ethno-nationalism written ab abroad in that newspaper. I know, folks, you're not going to be able to get me on uh, counts of ignorance. My very maternal grandparents buy that newspaper on a daily basis and spout the uh, claptrap that so very often emblazons its front pages on a weekly basis. I know what's in there, I read the damn thing when I'm round at their house, okay? So you're not going to get me on grounds of ignorance. Uh, Paul Dacre has um, presided over, yeah, as I say, the worst adversarial um, and thoroughly illogical and incorrect jingoism and nationalism <coughs> and hatred of all immigration per se um, for very, very, very many years. Um, a decent definition of jingoism. Uh, he also needles Douglas Murray on this kind of thing, um, wh wh where you talk about um, somebody not being classified as British, even though they've spent 15 years of their... They've spent 15 of their 15 years in Britain. Um, they just happen to be of, you know, Pakistani or, or Lithuanian or Romanian or um, Egyptian descent, that that somehow... Uh, means that they forfeit the right to call themselves British. They've had just as many cups of tea as Nigel Farage. Uh, they've carved just as many turkeys that they've had, just as many egg sandwiches and cucumber sandwiches. They've hoisted just as many Union Jacks, and yet somehow they aren't regarded as um, British citizens. Um, and that has essentially happened in the, in, the, in the Daily Mail. That's what he needles um, Paul Dacre on, and a, a blasé, um, in, you know, incredulity-inducing... Uh, diffidence and um, yeah, just just uh, a, a ridiculous inability, seemingly, um, or, or yeah, inability or um, reticence regarding uh, uh, criticizing uh, the right wing in power. Uh, next up, you have Andrew Neil, who I was very surprised to uh, I, I, was, I was surprised to see feature in this book. Um, he's the editor of the Spectator, and um, again, really, j Brian says that he essentially just made sure that an awful lot of people who are thinly veiled right-wing zealots were allowed to pose as uh, uh, ostensibly politically neutral individuals on talk shows and were allowed to interview one another. Um, Andrew Neil is essentially most famous now for in, uh, pioneering or, you know, coming up with the original idea for GB News, um, which is the largest hothouse of complete balderdash that you will find on British television. Tory MPs supposedly critically interviewing Tory MPs. Um, and also, yeah, O'Brien reiterates just how it is that um, much of their uh, content, much of the material produced, is that which would be in uh, a huge agreement with some of their billionaire funders. Um, and Andrew Neil comes from very, very humble beginnings as well and used to be um, a journalist of integrity, as we've mentioned already. Um, but thank, uh, 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 you know, disappointingly, unfortunately, that has gone by the wayside. Next up, we have Matthew Elliott, um, who was a... Again, one of the, just the leading figures in the vote leave uh, debate. Um, again, I might as well sort of um, park my prejudices or at least uh, my political predilections at the door. Um, I am now a staunch Remainer. I was a huge um, backer of the um, Eurosceptic project in 2016 to 2020. Um, but now I have thankfully um, issued those uh, vitriolic and most often indefensible views. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah, Matthew Elliott was, was probably the person that got Dominic Cummings on side and um, saw a weird um, sort of, what, what would you call it, just a, a merging of um, weirdly financed think tanks, um, 
the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, you know, uh, 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 vote leave, yada yada. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, not the IMF or anything like that. But 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 yeah, w weirdly named think tanks that occasionally prop up, uh, pr uh, crop up in the Spectator magazine. Um, who yeah, distort facts and who are yeah, just shamelessly dishonest to an increasingly uh, 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 angered readership and uh, yeah yeah listenership. Uh, next up, we have Nigel Farage, who is. The, the you know the biggest and most drooling and evil yellow teeth yellow toothed gargoyle in the whole book. Um, he was a little bit of a financier beforehand. Um, you know, got a, an education at Dulwich College, huge fee paying school, which probably charges thirty thousand per annum just to frequent the premises. Um, and yet, and, and and you know, gets a huge fee from GB News, and has always been immensely financially comfortable. And you know, does not I cannot sympathise at all with the plight of the poor. And yet, is able to um, you know, sh uh, not shroud himself, but but um, bathe in that weird water of anti-establishmentism. Apparently, is the man of the people, supposedly, and says what's on everyone's minds. Um, yada yada yada. Next up, we've got David Cameron and, and Jeremy Corbyn's in here as well. Um, just their ridiculous kowtowing and um, the, 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 the former David Cameron's um, ridiculous privilege, which, which, you know, meant that he was uh, essentially just elevated to positions that would otherwise have been uh, closed to him. You know, if he'd have grown up on the mean streets of Kingston-upon-Hull or um, goodness knows where, Totnes or uh, Hartlepool, or Milton Keynes, um, nobody would ever let such a, um, a bovine uh, pontificator, you know, would never have given him um, the wheel of power. Uh, we've also got a bits on Dominic Cummings as well. But that's essentially um, the run of the book. I've got a few sections that I want to highlight. Um, again, yeah, if, you, if I, I am informed once more by many of my demographers in the office um, that lots of you guys happen to hail from... Uh, Godsbury country of the United States. Uh, and if you don't understand any of this, then I would first of all inform you to read the book and ask me, you know, uh, uh, DM me on the Instagram, as it were, Joe underscore Spivey underscore, or leave a nice um, harmless comment down below. Uh, yeah, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read some of the sections out and then we'll, we'll press on from there, I imagine, because there are some things that I want to take James O'Brien on up on just 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 to prove that I'm not some liberal shill that's paid by I don't know the IMF and by Joe Biden to um, espouse some um, you know liberal tendencies or some non right wing sentiments um, but yes the, this is just the the, the the huge wadding introduction which I think James O'Brien ought to have shortened um, I think for the untrained and um, fragile reader this will be a little bit much but I'm trained not to be supercilious um, so yes this is an outline of the book. This book, then, is a charge sheet, a compendium of poor behaviour and bad actors. More importantly, it is, an, it is also an attempt to record and explain the creation of an ecosystem in which dishonesty could flourish and facts wither, where ordinary people, divorced from but entirely subjugated to the levers of power and influence, were fed an almost unleavened diet of deceit, division and distraction. Um, da -da -da -da. We will see that what has happened to the UK over the last few decades, notably since 2010, especially since 2016, and quite spectacularly since 2019, is as unforgivable as it is immense. Yada, yada, yada. Um, so that's, you know, outlining his place. Nicely done. Um, there are a few, you know, a, a few little twigs to trip up on, a few little oversights, a bit of elegant variation, a bit of unnecessary alliteration, um, a little bit, some, you know, repetition of suffixes or prefixes, which just you know, put the whole thing out of joint, but we can forgive a few um, stylistic deviances um, if the overall message, I think, is, 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 is really pretty good. Um, so next up, we have something that I want to take him up on, the, 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 the concept of cultural Marxism, I believe it's called. Um, when I first heard callers use the phrase cultural Marxism, for example, I had no idea what they were talking about. It is, I learned, a conspiracy theory widely regarded as far-right and anti-Semitic that accuses an unidentified intellectual elite of being embarked upon a secret international mission to replace Christian and conservative values with ill-defined liberal ills. Clearly crackers and deeply dangerous. The Nazis use the phrase cultural Bolshevism to similar effect. Again, if ever somebody used... Most of the time, if they're not a um, bona fide historian, if somebody references 1930s Nazi Germany, that is almost certainly the only historical period they are comfortable talking about. Um, 
Da -da -da -da. Dacre, Paul Dacre, was already banging this particularly ugly drum when he gave the, the Hugh Cudlip Memorial Lecture, yada yada yada. The BBC exercises a kind of cultural Marxism in which it tries to undermine conservative society by turning all its values on their heads. Now, just because something issues from the mouth of somebody prejudicial and illogical and anti-Semitic, Steve Bannon is quite possibly the worst human being on earth and is somebody, again like I've said of Donald Trump in the past, whose assassination I would not champion, but whose assassination would not sadden me, folks. Um, yeah, Steve Bannon's a horrible individual, but the fact that a message can spew from somebody who is objectionable doesn't necessarily make, render that um, uh, theory altogether groundless. Um, I would happily and admittedly wastefully be decapitated if you were to get a percentage from a survey of um, the academic institutions primarily. So every faculty leader, every CEO, every um, head of every university, particularly in Great Britain and the United States, if you were to survey them about their past associations with Marxism or their, um, you know, deep left reservations or, you know, some of their, yeah, Marxian dispositions, if that number was less than 90%, i.e., if you found, upon surveying, that, that fewer than 90% of those people had flirted with Marxism in the past, I would be happily decapitated, folks. James Bryan often says how you cannot, this is a really shadowy liberal elite, and how you can't point me to any of them. I can. I can get a list of every head of every academic institution between Britain and the United States, and they would all pretty much have flirted with Marxism in the past. I'm not saying that there is a cultural Marxism athwart or anything like that. It is, thankfully, a um, largely disregarded and disputed um, theory of... In of, of um, interrogating the world, but it runs amok in academic institutions. That is irrefutable. Just go there for 15 minutes to a humanities lecture and you will find it raw and screaming in your face. Um, so that's, again, O'Brien is doing the, the, the casuistry which he would obviously purport to deplore. He is practicing it and employing it himself. Um, but, I mean, now we're, now we're just going to talk about, um, this is when he, he takes apart Douglas Murray via Andrew Neil. Um, this is talking about white, uh, accusations of white supremacy. Um, this is obviously not a very cuddly video, folks, up for your Friday. I hope indeed that you're strapped in, because this is about to get very serious. Um, if the white supremacist accusation seems a little strong, it is worth noting something Douglas Murray wrote in 2013. This is the quotation marks. To study the latest census is to stir at one unalterable conclusion. Mass immigration has altered our country completely. It has become a radically different place, and London has become a foreign country. Careful. I'm not sure how this can be read as anything but an implicit insistence that non-white Britons are somehow foreign... Yeah, somehow foreign and therefore not properly British. Um, and then he says, yeah, I, I don't know how it is that you can't read it like that. And that is James O'Brien pretty much changing my mind about Douglas Murray on uh, the, 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 the toss of a coin, as it were, on the spin of a sentence. Um, I've, yeah, come to the conclusion that Douglas Murray is not somebody I ought to be um, ideologically in bed with, at least, anyway. Um, no sniggering in the back. Um, so, yes, that's, that's an example of James O'Brien, you know, just being very, 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 very persuasive. And um, giving us, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this is an excellent sketch of Nigel Farage. Uh, you will all know of him, regardless of whether you're from um, Nebraska, Namibia, or Newcastle. You'll all know about him. Um, people like Nigel Farage. Entire books have already been written about his rise to unearned prominence and his impact upon the political landscape. But the most simple and important element of his appeal is his appeal. He affects the demeanour of a mildly sozzled city gent dresses like a city-dwelling social misfits idea of a country squire, and reassures people it is fine to be discomforted by the nationality of their new neighbours, fellow passengers speaking different languages on their train, or the... <laughs> that's a smashed glass and water everywhere, and hordes of unidentified and unwelcome foreigners they never personally encounter but keep reading about in their morning newspaper. Throw in a Dulwich College education and the bonkers British deference that commands, and the essence of that appeal is distilled. So I've just broken a glass, folks, but I'm going to press on like the professional that I am. So that, <laughs> that was James O'Brien's How They Broke Britain. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I will be very, very uh, surprised if indeed you don't read this and um, suddenly find that your, uh, you, that your uh, political opinions are enlightened. If you've never read anything about Brexit or the breaking of Britain or you're um, somehow um, out of the loop as regards the turmoil of, of British politics over the last few years. Or indeed if 
Heaven forbid you happen to be a little bit of a Brexit sympathiser, you um, think that the Daily Mail is a, a reputable news organ, for example, if you, if you are of that persuasion and you happen to pick up this book, I think you will find that your, your mind is changed, folks. Um, so yes, that was, th th there is Mr O'Brien looking rather satisfied with himself and a little bit pensive, but those are decent adjectives to describe myself. So yes, um, I'm going to have to clean up a little bit of a mess that I made, folks, but um, you wouldn't know, would you? Um, I'm sure that I'll be in the arms of the BBC before I know it, because how extemporaneously brilliant was that? You wouldn't even have known. Um, but yes, I'm going to have to explain to my mother why there are shards of glass everywhere, um, but pfft, all in the day's work, folks, t'was ever thus. Um, <laughs> thank you ever so much for watching BookTube, and goodbye.